downstairs last week on the right. Wednesday morning video. My head is in the corner of the it is. It the whole time. Well, we'll have Sharon every time she leans forward, so <laughs> <laughs> kind of rock into the picture every once in a while, Sharon. <laughs> All right. Well, let us begin with the hymn. <laughs> By grace I'm saved, grace free and boundless. My soul believe and doubt it not. Why stagger at this word of promise? Has scripture ever falsehood taught? Know then this word must true remain. By grace you too will life obtain. By grace God's Son, our only Savior, came down to earth to bear our sin. Was it because of your own merit that Jesus died your soul to win? No, it was grace and grace alone that brought him from his heavenly throne. By grace this ground of faith is certain, as long as God is true it stands. What saints have penned by inspiration what in his word our God commands, our faith in what our God has done depends on grace, grace through his Son. By grace to dim in hearts that tremble, in tribulations earnest try. By grace, in spite of fear and trouble, the Father's heart is open wide. Where could I help and strength secure, if grace were not my anchor sure? Lord, sometimes I feel that promises just aren't enough to go on. When I am weak, remind me of the promises you have already kept. Your promises to forgive me, to be with me, and to give me all that I need in this life. Strengthen my faith in your promises of your providing, forgiving word, baptism, and Lord's Supper, and in the hope of eternal life with you. Bless my study of your promises and of those like Abraham who believed in them. Amen. Amen. Uh, do you know much about uh, this hymn? I looked it up. It's, it's LSB 566. The first stanza is the same as what's in here. The following three stanzas are completely different. In the LSB. In the LSB. It's the same author, but the... When I, when I um, looked it up on my phone and um, played the, the tape, because I know the hymn, but I can't remember how it went, there was a second stanza that's not in here, but the rest were the yeah, same. I think it's a really long hymn. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, if you go back to the, the, the real old one. <laughs> 15 verses or whatever. Yeah. Well, I know it's, yeah, it's, it was written in the 18th century, but, uh, so the first, the first stanza is word for word exactly the same, but, uh, they're, I, they're both great and the lyrics are great. I was just like, I don't remember this. So, the lifelight, uh, was written sometime between, I think it was around well, my, 2001, uh, but... My guess is that this is the version that's in LW. LW, because okay. Because this study is probably old enough not to, uh, uh, not to have been in the LSB well, that's, years yet. That's right, because that's LSB right. was 2006, so, I think. So what they did with the number of hymns in LSB is to... Um, revert back to TLH wording. Gotcha. And some of them they reverted back to TLH wording and kept the these and thousand eyes. Yep. As a bone that they threw to uh, TLH only people to try to get them sucked into the LSB. And then some of them they reverted back to the uh, TLH words but updated the 
these and dies and dows to use and whatever okay. the other pronouns are. That makes sense. So that would be my guess is that um, Yeah, so verse 2 is an addition. Okay. And uh, yeah, so if you look down at the bottom, text, uh, Christian Scheid, 1709 to 1761, translation, the Lutheran hymnal, 1941. Gotcha. And tune okay. is the setting is also the Lutheran hymnal, 1941. So uh, in the LW, they uh, uh, took out verse two, mm -hmm. and they uh, they may it may only be a four verse hymn in LW. Okay. By grace, this ground, yeah, and then timid heart. So these are all here. So two and six are the uh, either they shortened it to write it in here, yeah, or LW is just four verses and yeah. they shortened it in LW. And then they added back in verses two and six from the TLH. So that's what you. So that's what uh, a number of these studies. They wrote these life life studies over the course of many years, and then some of them they actually updated. I think this um, is one of them. All of them. All of them they updated. So they updated it, but didn't necessarily update it with the study. So this study is probably the same before the update. But what they updated was is they added the. Uh, the enrichment magazine, because the original life lights did not have the enrichment magazine. This okay. is the first time that I have. There hasn't been a read this one. That is correct. Yeah. Because well, we had one last year that, or two years ago, the same way. This is the okay. second time yeah. I've seen it. So, but yeah, all the other ones they said read this one. Right. And they were always in order because yeah. the yeah. first ones, the first ones they published and said, "Oh, enrichment magazine. Let's add these." And then somebody got smart and said, "Oh, we should have them read these at specific lesson moments." That's why. Okay. And then, and then, so some of them are edited and say, you know, lesson one, and they they jump around, and then some of them are actually in order that you read for lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. I haven't been bad at So that's yeah. So and that makes sense a, that this is LW this because. Is a, Right, so this is a uh, this is a many year in the making kind of a yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. Because the first one, someone out here, what's his name? And He's meeting with the Rick. Uh, Rick, Matthew, Rick. Rick said that uh, the first Romans one he went through in the '80s, so it would make total sense that that would be LW's yeah, very and, wording. And yeah. uh, and now you know more than you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, Total give aside because I. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> don't ask Pastor Schultz questions if you don't want so large. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, in fact, my uh, my first congregation in Washington, Missouri, people actually actually said Pastor Banger gives the uh, small catechism answers and Pastor Schultz gives the large catechism answers. Well, start calling so it's like Joel Luther Schultz. Uh, like, ah, uh, you're so funny. <laughs> I care about you more and want you to know more. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. There you go, right? All right, the review question. My personal study for week five. What are the four parts of the doctrine of justification? <laughs> I looked this one up for you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I yeah, it, confu it confused me. It's it's from the text of Romans. Okay. From a specific text of Romans. Yeah. Was that like a question from last week, though? No. They, nope. have, they, have, they have these all. What it <coughs> is a review it's question. A review attention. question. And they're always tough because you got to go back. I guess so. It could be from any of the previous or combination of the previous lessons. I don't know, they, the law which shows the way, is that one of them, or am I totally off base? You're not totally off base. Uh, that is, that uh, not in those words, but okay. but it's something to do with the law. Uh, I say the, four, the, the 
four part. I'd say that again. The righteous live by faith. The righteous live by faith. So faith is one. Work in the hearts of believers. God's grace alone. Grace, faith alone. In Christ alone. In Christ alone. And then the last one. God's glory alone with Scripture. See, she, uh, Pat went to the solas of the Reformation as well, and when I read through the study and saw what the author was thinking, I was like, oh, okay. Because all that was going through my mind, because she asked me this after choir, was grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. And then the fourth answer is specifically from Romans, apart from works of the law. Oh, thank you. Apart from works of the law. Grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. Yeah. So it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Yeah. It's by grace you've been saved through faith in Christ. And that's not of yourself, but it's a gift of God, not by works. So yeah. Faith alone, grace alone. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith in Christ alone. And that's not a, of yourself, but it's a gift of God, not by works. So, so it's right there, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 has all four. Right. And it's Paul, but yeah, yeah. That, that's a tough review. So it's, it's that Romans, but that is, I mean, that is Romans 3, right? I mean, right. but now a righteousness apart from works of the law, um, what, verse, Manifested 20, apart from verse 21, the law. but now a righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the Old Testament bears witness to it, mm -hmm. the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace. They're, they're right, it's all right there in verse yeah. 21 also. Yeah. So what's the last one again? Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, and not by works of the law. Not by works of the law. Which, so that, see, that's the, the cool thing, right? Romans 3, 21 and, 21 and 22 are so similar to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Yeah. Right? Those are just really tremendous parallel passages. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to day one, I'll read Romans 4, verses 1 to 8. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. All right, this matter in verse 1 refers to faith and works, an issue discussed in previous verses. See especially 3.28. Many Jews of Paul's day had created legends about Abraham as a man of works. By a special dispensation, the whole law was revealed to him, they said, a thousand years before it was given on Mount Sinai, and Abraham kept it all. He therefore received the promises of God as a reward for his good works. To counter this claim, to what does Paul appeal So to counter the claim that Abraham uh, kept the law and did the works of the law before it was given on Mount Sinai, and that's why he was counted righteous, what does Paul appeal to? The scripture quoted the Old Testament, Abraham believed God and he was counted in righteousness. Right. So it was uh, Paul appealed to scripture. Scripture, which is God's infallible word. And he appeals to this in Genesis 15. That it was Abraham's belief and faith in God and not his works that were counted to him as righteousness. And then Paul quotes uh, Psalm, this is Psalm 32, verse 1 that Paul quotes in verses 7 and 8. And when we say Paul appealed to the scripture, the law, the prophets, and the entirety of the Old Testament is what he is referring to here. 
And does anyone else have anything else on number one before we move on? All right, number two, what does scripture say about how, wow, how Abraham became righteous before God? Through faith. Through faith. Abraham believed, yep. had faith, and it was this that was counted to him as righteousness. So in number one, it said many Jews of, of Paul's day, and really again throughout time, they built up uh, these legends about Abraham. Uh, some of those legends uh, actually said that Abraham was uh, basically perfect in his works before God. Uh, Jewish tradition recognized Abraham's faith, but understood his righteousness to be found in his obedience uh, to God. Uh, and then even more than that, later citations, uh, I don't know if this is around Paul's time or not, uh, but later traditions suggested that Abraham's faith, so they are talking about his faith, but they said Abraham's faith merited, uh, achieved merits before God for future generations of Israelites. So not works, but faith. So they got the faith right, but then they said that it merited, uh, or that it had merits before God for future generations of Israelites. And Paul appeals to uh, Scripture in Genesis 15 especially to refute that. So number three, compare and contrast working for wages with receiving a gift, which is in verse 4 and 5, and apply this to our salvation. You earn a wage through work. It's something you've earned, but a gift... You didn't earn. It's so from we the can't grace earn our salvation. It's a gift. Right. Can't earn our salvation. It is a gift. Wages are ones due for doing one's job. So a gift is not due to anyone. A gift is only freely given. Workers expect and deserve to be paid. And gifts, as you said, Pam, are often not just freely given, but gifts are often undeserved and given out of love by the giver, not out of obligation. So our dominant worldly view generally wants us to follow the employment metaphor in desiring to receive what is owed or fair from God based upon works. So people say... I'm going to heaven because I'm nice. because I'm a nice person. Yep. Uh, I think especially here in America, because we're very uh, law-oriented, and it doesn't just go for America, I guess. That could go for the entire Western world that's uh, really law-oriented. Uh, the idea of fairness and getting one's due, um, and that, that has uh, creeped into Christianity in general, even though Christianity, uh, since the very beginning, has focused more and primarily on God's work on our behalf rather than our work earning mm -hmm. anything. Anything else on number three? All right, 4A. David sings about the blessing of God's gift of righteousness or spiritual prosperity. What happens when we try to hide our sins? I just like the way it was written. My bones are wasted away through my groaning. Your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sacked as in the heat of summer. I just thought that, that was... It's a very... Visual, uh -huh. yeah. You can see mm -hmm. it. You can almost feel it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's I. Almost. I love the Psalms for for that reason and the the poetry of the Old Testament. You can see it. You can feel it. It's extremely vivid. 
uh, all of those things. And so to your point, uh, yes, when we try to hide our sins uh, or fail or fail to repent, uh, we oftentimes very literally kind of waste away physically and spiritually. Makes you wonder how much of the depression that people have today is so much about loneliness as what they're carrying on their heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I look at I look at uh, like society as a whole and the things that we try to justify, like uh, abortion, um, sexuality, all these things, gender identity, and all these things, and how how loudly kind of our culture shouts about these things. And I think, as I see it, you know, there's a slogan out there now that says like, uh, "Shout your abortion" and, and things like this. That that uh, I look at it and it looks like this suppressing of, uh, to me, it's almost blatantly like, we understand that this is wrong, but we are gonna shout at the top of our lungs to try to make ourselves feel better about this thing that our conscience is telling us is wrong. And we're just gonna push it down and try to build ourselves up and encourage ourselves in this kind people of- People do that all the time. Yeah. I mean, that's why people uh, rally around um, televangelists like Joyce Myers or um, Joel Osteen because they make them feel good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There isn't sin. Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers talks about absolutely no sin. Right. They simply talk about being better uh, in your life as a Christian, um, being better and then God will bless you and then it's all okay. So minimize sin, um, magnify works or excuses. Right? Minimize sin, magnify works and excuses, and attempt to feel better about your crappy life. Right. Good luck. I mean, that's only crushing over time. You can. I mean, people people though con themselves for a long, long time. I mean, there are people who will die without the crushing weight of sin, right? Because they've you know conned themselves into thinking that they can uh, um, minimize sin and maximize. Um, works and um, happy feelings and whatever else that uh, takes away that crushing weight of sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. But some people will be crushed. Yeah. Right? Some people will be crushed. And those are the people that Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons pray on. Mm -hmm. They pray on the people that are crushed. Right? Mm -hmm. And then they, like Joel Osteen, teach them how to live a better life and not be crushed anymore. It's the same. It's the same thing just by, that, that's why I would contend Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, they are not Christians. Um, the people that go and see them may well be Christians, but I don't think they're Christians. I don't think they have anything to do with uh, a Savior, Jesus, who saves from sin. They're, they are no different than Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who say, live a better life and God will bless you and, mm -hmm. and then your sin doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. but, but that's, I mean, so a Joel Osteen um, doesn't go door to door preying on people, but you know people that are crushed go to Joel Osteen and feel better. People mm -hmm. that are crushed have a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon knock on their, especially Mormons, Mormon knock on their door and they feel better because oh my gosh, my life, my life is so crushing, and now you're you're saying that I just need to live a better life. Show me how to live a better life, mm -hmm. and it's all it's all fake. Yeah. It's not real. The, the other side of that with Osteen is prosperity theolo theology and you know and he's always saying you know you will be blessed God is going to shower blessings upon you blah blah and then all of a sudden you're sitting there and it's been five years and I have been in just the dumps with bad things happening it's like okay God hates me and if you, you know? recognize yeah. it if you recognize it you're even more crushed by the wall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I actually contend that a lot of people never recognize it I think people die without actually recognizing that prosperity gospel is garbage that doesn't work, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but the people who recognize it are crushed even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's found more subtly, too, in, in uh, some mostly uh, churches that are part of a denomination that will say that they are a gospel-only church, uh, saved by the gospel, and then what you hear from Sunday to Sunday, and I know someone... someone uh, in my life, who goes to one of these churches that's a gospel-only church, 
and you go to church every week and it's do not do this, 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 and all of these things. And so more subtly, it's a, a complete failure to distinguish law and gospel uh, because the gospel, essentially the underlying idea, even if it's not explicitly stated, is that the gospel is for unbelievers. And once you are a believer, then you need the law and you need to obey. And so there are churches that, uh, that I've heard there are some pastors that I know who grew up in certain churches that said, uh, I heard the gospel as a Christian who went to this church on Easter. And that was it. Yeah, I, um, you, know, you make a fair point. I would say probably like this. Uh, a gospel-only church is really a law-only church. Yes. They have very little to do with the, go with the gospel. Mm -hmm. Joel Osteen says the word gospel, but he yeah. has no idea what the gospel is. And I've seen interviews with him. Uh, I mean, not just what he does on whenever he does it, Sunday or Wednesday or whenever, but um, I've seen actually interviews with him, and there is nothing that he says that is conspicuously Christian. Because he does law only. Even, yeah, I was going to say, even in the person of Christ, in, in like there was an interview where... Only as an example. He'll, he'll, yeah. he'll mention Jesus yeah. as an example of how to live, yeah. right? And that's law, law only. Now, he yeah. doesn't call himself gospel only, but, but that's the kind of church that does call himself gospel only, and they're really law only. Yes. They, they have no idea what the gospel is. Yeah. It's sad. Mm -hmm. That's so sad. Yeah, because they're impacting so many people. Yeah, you know? the church is full. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And that, I think, is uh, 4A, what happens when you try to hide those sins or you go to those kinds of places to try and feel better, really, the, the suffering uh, physically and emotionally is you're just driven into despair. Uh, because And driven into despair, which we as Lutherans are too, but that's the point of the law is to get you to the point where you recognize your need for a Savior. That's why we do an altar call every Sunday in a Lutheran yeah. church. You don't come to the altar, but but we do an altar call every Sunday in the Lutheran Church. Every Sunday. And uh, yeah, and, and, and instead an of just call, being driven so to an, despair, an and altar everything. call in a lot of like non-denominational churches, they have a big rally. They uh, uh, make you feel really bad about your sins, and then they <laughs> say anybody who wants to can come up and you know. Um, uh, declare their faith in Christ and receive forgiveness, blah, blah, blah. All right, I mean, we do it much better and much more theologically appropriate. Um, but uh, but we have that kind of non-denominational altar call every Sunday because you confess your sins and then you hear Jesus' words of forgiveness from your pastor. Right? And that's why the vicar doesn't do the absolution. Mm -hmm on Sunday morning um, as a general, hey, we're all forgiven kind of a thing. No, we, you hear the words of Jesus from your pastor. Mm -hmm. right. It's much, much better. We do it much, much better than yep. an altar call that you might have um, at a non-denominational church or a Baptist church. Yep. Because but, I know multiple people then, right, who, who think that the altar call, mm -hmm. we do it every week in confession and absolution, but in churches who would do like what what you typically think of as an altar call. I know four or five people uh, who believe this altar call thing is supposed to be this once, like, life-changing moment thing, and then after a while they're like, I, I've gone up there four or five times, and I don't really feel much different. Like, it never really works out for me. And it's really sad. Mm -hmm. All right, 4B. What happens when we do confess our sins to God? We are forgiven, and I think especially of uh, part of that confession and absolution again, uh, 1 John 1 9. Uh, if we that would have been confess, a good one to add. I mean, that popped into my head, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and he mentioned Psalm 32 5, but it's in our service. If we confess our, gifts, our sins before God our Father, or if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful, faithful and just, and just yeah. will forgive yeah. our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have a couple of notes before we move on uh, today, too. So if uh, most of you are probably reading from the ESV translation, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, is anybody reading from the NIV? We have a couple? Yep. So in the ESV, verse 
uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Uh, the NIV says, What was discovered by Abraham? And uh, the they're both right, but this is an instance where the NIV is, is uh, more correct, and it has... Uh, it has the sense that what Abraham found and then lived out. Because the verb there in Greek is heurisko, which is to find. Uh, and, and when the ESV translates it as gained, it's to obtain through discovery. That's verse uh, 1, verse 1 in chapter 4. Uh, and then Luther has an interesting quote about um, Abraham, that if you should ask what Abraham was before he was called by a merciful God, Joshua answers that he was an idolater, that is, that he deserved death and eternal damnation. And so when you have these Jewish traditions building up and saying that Abraham was perfect in his deeds of the law before God, or that he kept the law before the law was given on Mount Sinai, or that his faith achieved merit for future generations, think about the fact that Abraham twice lied about his wife yeah. Sarah uh, to save his own skin, and then also his conduct toward, uh, uh, really it was his impatience in waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled when he uh, goes into his servant Hagar and has Ishmael through her instead of through Sarah as God promised. So, so the two examples that are used in verse 4 of these uh, people in faith, and in the first uh, eight verses with him quoting David as well in the Psalms, uh, both of these people are very clearly flawed in themselves, as you can read it clearly in the Old Testament accounts. So, just uh, a more, more information there. Uh, and I think for Romans 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, that really is a simple definition of to believe. I really like his use of, like, the civil realm of work and wages. Um, and it's to work is to be owed something, and to believe is to not work. Passive. All right. Is everybody ready to move on to day two? All right. Romans 4, 9 to 13. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of faith, of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So number six then, summarize Paul's argument in Romans 4 verses 9 to 11. Summarize Paul's argument in Romans 4, verses 9 to 11. I said, salvation and uh, righteousness are available to both the Jew and the Gentile, whether you're circumcised or not. Whether you're circumcised or not. Right. Anyone else? It, they use the word imputed a lot. And, and, and I have, because God imputed his righteousness upon Abraham even before he was circumcised. Mm -hmm. And imputed, again, I think uh, means <coughs> it's there. Um, okay. you know, put on. Put, put on. on. Put on. Put on, yeah. Mm -hmm. He believed and was counted righteous 
before the rite of circumcision was even instituted. So before there, and then the, and then he says that the circumcision is a seal of the righteousness so, that he was. So given. so then can a Gentile believe before being circumcised or without being circumcised? I think this that's, is a cool note too. That's the argument. Yeah. Abraham believed without circumcision. Gentile can believe. Abraham was believed in righteous without circumcision, and a Gentile can believe and be righteous without circumcision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another reason why we come uh, together as fellow Christians to Bible study uh, is because of things like this uh, pretty cool note. So, Abraham's faith and belief in God was credited to him as righteousness in Genesis chapter 15. And then circumcision... I have a question. I'm sorry, yeah. I have a question. Um, would uh, uh, circumcision, I, I, I always thought and I always believed that circumcision was a covenant with God. Is that correct or not? Yeah, it was, it was what did we say uh, a week or two ago? It's the sign of the covenant. A sign of the covenant. Okay, so, so if you weren't circumcised, then you're snubbing your nose at God's covenant and you're lost. So a Gentile in the Old Testament, how is a Gentile saved? Become a Jew. Not Jew, there are no Jews in the Old Testament. Israelite. Become an Israelite by believing the covenant with God and being circumcised as a sign that you have faith in that covenant. Right? So so words matter. It has to be spoken exactly like that where you start futzing it all up, mm -hmm. and then you make it about circumcision. That's what the Jews are doing here. They're making it about circumcision. Right. Paul's saying it's not about circumcision. It's about God's promises and the fulfillment of those promises and faith in those promises. And circumcision was just a sign that you believe the promises of God. <coughs> does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. All right. So... Um, yeah, so in the Old Testament, to be saved, you have to be in Israel by faith, by faith in the covenant of God and the sign that you believe that covenant, circumcision. In the New Testament, because everything is sucked up into Christ, right, everything, the people, the land, the temple, the uh, ceremonies, the sacrifices, circumcision, all sucked up into Christ. So now what do you have to be in to be part of God's people? Christ. Christ. En Christo is the Greek. You have to be in Christ. So in the Old Testament, you had to be in Israel. This is why Israel was supposed to be what to the nations? A light. Light. light to the nations. You know, it's not don't go into the light that you see in movies. It's go into the light. Right? <laughs> Israel's a light to the Gentiles. So go into the light and become an Israelite. Become an Israelite. You need to be in Israel because that's the people of God. Who is the people of God in the New Testament? Specifically one person. Christ. Jesus. Who is the son? Who is the son in the Old Testament? Israel is God's son. In the New Testament, the son is Jesus. So to be the son of God in the Old Testament, you had to be in Israel. To be the son of God in the New Testament, you have to be in Christ. Not church. In Christ. Mm -hmm. And I like Dr. Dr. Lessing, especially... Uh connecting it to the four servant songs in Isaiah, starting in chapter 42, constantly refers to Christ as Israel reduced to one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think that's one of the coolest uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. things that I learned. Uh, I think it was just... Yeah. So, yeah, so cool. if, you say, if you say you have to be in church, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Can someone go to heaven without ever having stepped foot in a church? Yes. I mean, what if it's a Christian who, I don't know, lives somewhere where there isn't a church and isn't other believers, right? 
very possible for someone yeah. to be saved. You don't. It's not being in church. It's being yeah. in Christ, who is Israel reduced to one. Mm -hmm. And another, just quick note on uh, covenant. Just because I, I feel like we. Oh wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Quick note. Yeah. Because being in church makes salvation about a work, work and act, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's not about being in church. You're in church because you are in Christ, and it is the place where Christ promises to be with His gifts. Yep. And so why wouldn't you be in church? That's kind of stupid, yeah. right? But we're in Christ, mm -hmm. and that's why we're sons of God. Yeah, I think of a person that was on life support, you know, but not brain dead. I mean, you know, um, they were cognitive, but they had to have a respirator working for them, and, and they couldn't get to church because, you know, they were, you well, know, but they were death, going, A deathbed convert. Maybe yeah. has never been in a church, right? So you're not in the church, you are in Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. And that person dies in Christ mm -hmm. and is a son of God. Right. right. So that makes you remember... The, sorry, yeah, the, the covenant that we need to be reminded of what the covenant was, and we talked about it either last week or a couple weeks ago, about how this covenant that God made uh, with Abraham is one-sided. So even even the covenant of the Old Testament, uh, and how we talked about uh, the covenant, how a covenant was cut is kind of bloody, uh, and that both parties would walk through, so it says, if I don't uphold my end of the deal, uh, let me be as this animal slain before us, uh, but in God's covenant with his people, and especially with Abraham, God is the only one who walked through. So it's a one-sided covenant. And I just think that that whenever covenant language comes up with regard to Christian faith, that idea of the covenant needs, we need to be reminded of that, that it's one-sided. Even in the Old Testament, when we think about law, 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 and works of the law and sacrifice. So... That's just a quick note of, uh, and reminder. And then, uh, the, the reason we come to Bible study and the things that we might not necessarily get is because Abraham is credited, uh, has righteousness credited to him in chapter 15 of Genesis uh, because he believed. And uh, the rite of circumcision takes place in chapter 17, and uh, it is likely that a period of between 14 and 29 years is between Abraham being credited with righteousness and circumcision being instituted. So, so we think two chapters, it's very close and very connected, it's kind of immediate, but two chapters, and it could have been anywhere between 14 and 30 years, between those events. All right, so number seven. Does anybody else have questions or comments before we move on to number seven? All right, why are you considered a child of Abraham? And it says, see also Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Why are you considered a child of Abraham? Greg, you mentioned this in your answer just a minute ago. We receive the sign of circumcision in our hearts and in baptism. He is the father of all who believe. He is the father of all who believe. I like the Abra Abraham seed. Mm -hmm. The neighbor is according to the promise. And this kind of <laughs> this reminds me of of how. Uh, uh, the, the Roman Catholic idea of uh, apostolic succession. Uh, we talked about that earlier on in, in this class about the idea of, of the Pope uh, just being this constant line of someone who uh, directly uh, was associated with an apostle or who learnt from an apostle, and that's apostolic succession. Um, and so that's their idea. And I, it kind of reminds me of this idea of being a child of Abraham because it's your blood lineage. Uh, it, it reminds me of that in the fact that, so uh, they would say that we don't have apostolic succession in the Lutheran church, um, which we wouldn't 
necessarily claim, but they claim apostolic succession, but what the church needs is uh, the apostolic witness and teaching and faithfulness to their witness about Christ. So even then, it's not just about being a direct descendant or a direct student of the apostles, it's about teaching what the apostles themselves actually taught and not messing with that. So that kind of reminds me of that whole paradigm. <clears throat> Any other comments or questions on number seven? All right, on to number eight. To walk in the footsteps does not mean doing the good works that Abraham did, but rather believing in God's promises as he did. How do you know that the promise mentioned in verse 13 is a promise given to you as one of Abraham's offspring? So verse 13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So how do you know that the promise mentioned in verse 13 is a promise given to you? By faith. By faith. Yeah, I, I wrote a seal, of the righteous, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which we had while still uncircumcised, just like Abraham was uncircumcised. That we had while still uncircumcised. Anyone else? All believers in Christ are offspring of Abraham and, this, is, this one's pretty cool, and heirs of the whole world. All right, anything to add there? All right, number nine. What can it all mean that we actually inherit the world? So it has you uh, looking around at Psalms, Matthew, Romans, Revelation. What can it mean that we actually inherit the world? Psalm 37 says the meek inherit the land. The meek inherit the land. That's Psalm 37, you said? Matthew 5 says, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. So then who are the meek? The believers. Fellow heirs with Christ. Fellow heirs with Christ, believers, uh, and to throw in the language of meek, they are the humble believers. Mm -hmm. The but humble believers in here. Considered weak, you know. Right. I think. I, I yeah. Think too many people, when they hear the word meek, they think you're supposed to be submissive and weak, you know. But humility is what it's about. But it also doesn't mean that you're not that you're not weak. That you are strong in in the faith, and you know. So, I too many people I've talked with always think that meek means that you're weak. And I don't think that's right. You could say uh, strong in and because of, of Christ mm -hmm. and a, a recognition of your, the inability of self. Mm -hmm. Right? What, do you have anything to add to that, to the language of meek or anything? Yeah, I, I really think humility, humbleness. Mm -hmm. uh, every believer shall live in a new earth. Mm -hmm cleansed from all the sin and filth. So when Christ returns, he is going to purge uh, the earth from all sin and evil. In resurrected and glorified bodies, we shall never experience death, mourning, or pain again. Best of all, we shall experience the joyous presence of God and his complete and unequivocal delight in us, his created and redeemed sons and daughters. I'm trying to, is it Revelation 21, 1 to 4, uh, that says that God's dwelling place will once again be with man and he will be their God? I, I, it goes back to Genesis and, the, and God's purpose in creation to uh, 
as an image and reflection of his glory and everything about creation, and especially the crown of his creation, human humanity, is supposed to reflect his glory and praise back to him. And so uh, we are heirs, and we actually inherit the whole world because that's the purpose that God created the world with, is so that his people whom he created in his image would uh, reflect and praise him and do what they were created to do. Um, and that's, that's the very purpose of the, of the world being created. At least that's our, our purpose as creatures in God's created world. Anything else to add to that? All right, we will move on to day three. Romans 4, 14 to 16. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So what does verse 14 say about living by the law? It doesn't mean anything. The it, promise is worthless. The promise is worthless. The faith is null and void. Faith is null and void. Anyone else here? I mean, it's like, okay, we could get there by adhering to the law. What would we need faith for? What would we need faith for if we could get there by the law? And if inheriting eternal life was possible through the law, yeah, then what's the point of the gospel? What's the point of the promises of God? Uh, and I take it all the way to the cross. If inheriting eternal life through the law is possible, then Christ did not need to die. Which is why the example uh, that some uh, Christians, and I wouldn't say that, I don't know if entire denominations or traditions would say this, but there are Christians in many camps who would say that uh, Christ dying on the cross was an example of God's love for us. And then they kind of leave it at that. And that, reducing it to an example, uh, or as a show of God's love for us, actually, it, it's kind of painful to hear. <laughs> um, but that is, it has been reduced to that by some theologians and some Christians. That, uh, it is not merely an example. It is all the things that we've talked about before this in Romans, it is an atonement, uh, a sacrifice in our place, uh, the perfect and final sacrifice in our place. So, so if it's an example of God's love and you leave it at that, then it accomplishes nothing for us in regard to our sin. It accomplishes nothing for us. And I think that's, that's more of uh, kind of the implication of uh, verse 14. If inheriting eternal life was possible through the law, then not just the promises... Uh, not just, yeah, not just the promises of God, but Christ's death on the cross also was the point. Yeah, my name reminded me of a friend of mine, he was a property manager, and, and uh, he, he was Mormon, and he, he said that they don't put much weight on the crucifixion because in the garden, when Jesus was praying, sweating blood, and that every everyone sinned he was going through and he was thinking of everyone that had sinned and he was taking it on at that time and so the crucifixion really is nothing that much to them it's all about in the garden right i was just going to say you 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 got there and that's exactly what i was thinking uh as you said they didn't put much weight on the crucifixion it's because they put it all in the garden mm -hmm. because uh 
I believe it's Luke, right? The Gospel of Luke says uh, that in the garden his sweat became like drops of blood. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they really, they really drive that home, yeah. uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. It's very interesting. But his sweat became like uh, drops of blood. And, and the cross, though, the, I don't know, the blood pouring yeah. out uh, yeah. from his side and with the water. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know how you would prioritize the garden over the crucifixion. That's very strange. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in the <laughs> <laughs> So we're we're saved we're saved by his birth, life, suffering, Correct. death, resurrection, and ascension. But if he doesn't die, you have nothing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So so the garden is not the act of atonement. It's part of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. right. As is his whole incarnational life and ministry. Exactly. Because it all is about what he came to do, his mission to fulfill God's will and not his own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything leads to death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. All right, 11a, why does the law bring wrath? Because we can't keep it. Because we can't keep it. I mean, you've got to keep it from the moment you're born to the moment you die. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, you have to keep it. And keep it perfectly. Perfectly. If you violate just one, one point of it. Right. You'll do it all. Give just a little bit of acting to your mother. <laughs> and then what really drives the what really drives all that home from, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, keep it perfectly. And then what does Jesus say about your thoughts and thinking yeah. thinking an evil Lord, thought Lord, about Lord, your brother. Lord, yeah. You're done from the moment your uh, thought is conceived in your head that is anything outside of the will of God and what he would have you think or do. So I I think once you get to that point and, and Jesus tells you that, that if an evil thought is conceived, if it even sprouts in your mind, I'm just like, okay, done for. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're all done for. No. It's hard enough to say that, like, so I think about the rich young man that comes and asks Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, and then he says that I've kept all these. In my mind, I'm like, really? I mean, I know that's not the whole point Just of the text. Why? Therefore, you did it. Right. <laughs> that's the, that's, it comes to my mind every time. Oh. I, I said that you're lying now. But, but if he never stole anything, if he never killed anybody right and you're thinking that that's the letter that you have to keep of the law not like jesus said well if you hate your brother that's and you're right. violating the fifth yeah. commandment yeah. So, you know, so. yeah and, and you could take so that he too. was looking at it literally the word i think mm -hmm. yep and if you do one said it just what well, it said begets another one mm -hmm. until the chain is broken through repentance you yeah. just have to keep repent, repenting. I, if you've broken any uh, commandments in the second table of the law, if you've broken any commandments uh, by, by mistreating your fellow human being, then you've broken the first commandment. And if you've broken the first commandment, you cannot possibly fulfill any of the second table of the law because... The first commandment is about loving God above all things and making him your God. And if you can't do that, you can't properly love and be of service to your neighbor. You could do good things for them, maybe materially or in the flesh, but you cannot keep the whole, the whole of it. Uh, so, yeah, one sin begets another. And you break one commandment, you break them all. Any attempt to fulfill the law is imperfect, and God demands perfection. So that's the essence of 11a. All right, 11b. 
The second half of Romans 4.15 may be quoting a legal saying common in Paul's day. It says, in effect, that an act is not a crime if there is no law against it. Paul refers to the period when Gentiles had not yet been taught God's law. Nevertheless, to what law are people accountable, even if they do not have God's law, as revealed in the Bible? To the law written on their hearts and in their consciences. Right. Right, yeah, the law that is written on their hearts from the beginning, from creation, the testimony of their conscience, uh, and we would refer to this as uh, the natural law that is written on the hearts of all humanity. And Paul already talked about in earlier, and we talked about it in, in class, is that even though you may not have the Mosaic law uh, given on Mount Sinai, you are still accountable to breaking this natural law that is written on your hearts. That law you are at least accountable to. And so everyone, regardless, Jew, Gentile, Everybody falls short. All right, number 12. There are two Greek words for promise. One kind of promise is unconditional, as when a mother promises to love a child no matter what the child does. The other kind of promise is conditional. For example, I promise to wash the dishes if you promise to take out the trash. Which kind of promise better describes the use of the word in verse 16? So verse 16, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, in order that the promise may rest on grace. So what, which word for promise is better here? Unconditional or conditional? Unconditional. Unconditional. That is correct. There are no conditions. Uh, faith is not some kind of work that we do on the basis of which God forgives us. And I really think outside of just the, the, the grammar uh, part of it that there are two words in the Greek for, for promise, one being unconditional and one conditional. Uh, as, we, as you're reading it in English, link in your mind that the promise may rest on grace. So if the promise rests on grace, then it is very clearly an unconditional promise that is freely given as a gift. Anything to add there? All right, number 13. Which two groups of people are meant by those who are of the law and those who are of the faith of Abraham? Also in verse 16. The ones of the law that Israelites... Yeah. Yep. And then the ones, those who are of the faith of Abraham at this point would be Christians. Right. It, it, in Jews, it's Jews and Gentiles here, which is uh, uh, Paul has Jewish Christians. Right. Jewish Christians and the and Gentile Christians. So this is Jews and Gentiles, and those who are of the law. I reading the verse again would have to be would have to be not just Jews but Jewish believers in Christ in that in the context of verse 16 think around this time when when Paul is writing to the Romans uh, this is I'm not sure before, after, or in the middle, but this is around the time when whoever was the emperor of Rome uh, had expelled Jews from the city. And so this is a, at a time when uh, 
a mixed audience is is more common than having primarily one or the other. People people have argued that that Paul's audience more leans to more one side than the other. Uh, but given that context, this is about that time when when people when when Jewish people are being expelled from Rome. Uh, this is a, a very mixed audience. All right. Anything else on number thirteen? All right. Day four. Romans four seventeen to nineteen. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the one of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was good as which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. All right, so, can someone read Genesis 17, 5? Seventeen five. That's correct. No longer shall your name be called Abram. You shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of multiple nations. Thank you very much. So God changed Abraham's name from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, father of many. What is implied by many nations? All who believe. Yeah, it implies more than the physical relationship. It's what uh, we talked about earlier in, in Abraham's very purpose, in, in his offspring's purpose, that God gave them to be a light to the Gentiles. I like numerous as stars in the skies. As numerous as the stars in the skies. Which then... You know, you, you read through, and, and God does indeed bless Abraham with a ton of descendants within Israel itself, but then if you think about it too, then if we're all part of Abraham's family by faith in God, okay, then it, then it, then it really expands. So, so it, it's kind of cool to see that promise being fulfilled on that uh, on the level of just biological familial relations and how big, how you think about how when the, e, uh, the Israelites were in Egypt that the Pharaoh was concerned uh, that the Israelites were multiplying like crazy and were going to outgrow them as a people and this is part of the reason why he wanted to put them in shackles and make them servants lest they would uh, overpower them through sheer numbers. So you see it being this promise of God being fulfilled on the biological level, but then when we talk about being family of Abraham in faith, then the promise is fulfilled in, I don't know, a more complete, a more expansive way. All right, 16a, relate the God who gives life to the dead to the story of Abraham and Sarah. In what way were they dead? Old. Oh. <laughs> Old. Old. <laughs> well, I mean, I, Sarah at this point, you know, hasn't given birth her entire life. She's 90 years old. So her insides, you know, they're anything like they are these days. <laughs> They've been dead for a while. Uh -huh. And now she's going to not only have a child, but lift her. <laughs> but, <laughs> not only have a child, <laughs> but lift her. See, the idea of having a baby now is just... <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so they're reproductively dead and past childbearing years, and yet God promised and gave them a child and many offspring. And then you... I think the whole family is dead, too. Right? I mean, it's not just that uh, the childbearing is dead and off the table, but because they didn't have children, Abraham's line is dead. Yeah. Right? He actually has to adopt a whatever 60 or 70 year old servant, Eliezer, to be an offspring of his and carry on his family. But I mean, that's right, that's not Abraham, right? Abraham's family is dead, and it's only through adoption that it can even live. Mm -hmm. But they had a child. But they had a child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before he had, oh, before, before oh, okay. they had Isaac, right? Mm -hmm. It's always interesting to think about Sarah's reaction to. <laughs> it kind of re it yeah. reminds me of, uh, of Zechariah, right, with with John, that Sarah kind of laughs and yeah. uh, God is like, yeah, okay, right, and but. They ultimately believe this promise, and I think it's 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 cool to see too that he promises them uh, children, and they're already old age. But then they they still have to be patient and wait. Like he doesn't do it at the yeah. snap of a finger. They have to wait and be patient and rely on God's promise and believe in His promise, and so uh, wait for the child that has been promised to them. So Sarah's reaction is maybe relatable and understandable. It's funny though how he, he kind of did the same thing the disciples did when Judas betrayed Jesus. They cast lots to get Matthias as the 12th disciple again. Abraham decided he had to go take what, Rachel? Rachel? The servant Hagar. The servant, Hagar. 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 And, and have a child. You know, God did not do it. I mean, you said this. I guess I got to take things matters in my own hand. It's like, so? <laughs> right? And I believe, now I could be wrong, so uh, I'll ask if Pastor knows. I believe that it is by Ishmael that that uh, Islam claims its descendancy from Abraham. Yeah, right. yeah. It is through yeah. Ishmael. Yeah. Because I, God, this was not the child that God had for Abraham and Sarah. All right. What's interesting about that, though, is uh, it doesn't mean that they couldn't have been part of Abraham's household, right? And become right. Well, God is a right circumcised child of the covenant, right? It's just the family isn't going to pass through them, right? And yet, and yet, uh, they they don't they don't stay, right? I mean, just because Sarah drives them away doesn't mean that they couldn't have stayed, and it's sort of sad then that. The Ishmaelites then are, by the time you get down to Joseph, are not God fearers anymore, right? And sell Joseph into slavery. And especially given the fact that God was gracious to Hagar too after this, He didn't just forget Abraham's servant, and that He used her for uh, to try and gain this promise in His own time, uh, but that God was gracious to Hagar, His servant, and did not just just because she was not the one through whom the family would continue, that he didn't just forget about her and he was gracious to her, which then makes the whole thing even more tragic that eventually they are not part of God's family. Because God did not forget her. All right. I believe, are we on 16A? 16A, uh, actually, yeah, so they were reproductively dead. Okay, so 16B then. What does the miracle in verse 19 have in common with the miracle, the miracle, the miracle in verse 24? So 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, and then 24. But for ours also it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Someone was raised from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Dead womb. Dead womb, dead tomb. Well, and, and 
You could add in here too, uh, God fulfilling his promise in a variety of ways. So he fulfills his promise to Abraham and Sarah who were reproductively dead and past their childbearing years. He fulfilled the promise of the Savior to uh, someone who was, who was uh, very fruitful reproductively, but who had never had marital relations. So through a virgin, then he fulfills the promise of sending his Savior in uh, not a barren or a dead womb, uh, but through a virgin's womb. And um, then also raises Christ uh, from the dead out of the tomb and I don't feel like it was it was missed but you could all I, you theologically insert that Christ you were also raised from the dead so Paul has already mentioned in Romans that we are dead in our trespasses that we all fall short of the glory of God of God and so uh, if if Salvation is by faith, uh, through the grace of God, and not of our own doing, then we were dead before Christ claimed us. And unable to do anything in regards to our salvation before God, unable to please Him or do any, any good work, because then Hebrews uh, tells us that good work, truly true good works are done in faith in Christ, so apart from from faith, good works are really not even possible. Uh, and so each one of us has been raised from the dead. All right, so C, anything else to add before we move on to C? All right, so the phrase and I'm assuming this phrase is God who gives life to the dead, also has two additional meanings for us. What are those two additional meanings? What was eternal life? Eternal life, yep, that is one. Eternal life, which is ours now, even as we are still sinners and saints, and who, unless Christ returns... Uh, before our time, we'll still have to endure our, our own physical death. And even though we still face our own physical death, eternal life is ours now and in eternity through faith in Christ. And then what's the other one? Resurrection? Yes, the resurrection, the raising of our bodies on the last day. And which includes everybody, even those that aren't. Correct. Raised to eternal damnation. I, yeah, that, so there are then those, those uh, theories about hell and condemnation and damnation, and one of the most popular ones, uh, uh, not universalism, so universalism says that, that everybody is going to go to heaven and ultimately be saved by God. But then there's the, the view of condemnation of total annihilation, the annihilation of the sinner, uh, so that they will be completely wiped out of existence. But, no, they are going to be raised from the dead too, and in a body of their own raised from the dead will then have to endure eternal death just as we will enjoy eternal life in a real body. Is that first or second Peter? It's in it's in Peter and one of his epistles, but I'll look at it later. All right. We are flying through this. All right, 17. In Old Testament times, a man hoped for at least one son who would inherit from him. In the absence of a son, the nearest living male became the heir. So this is what Pastor mentioned with, uh, was it Eliezer? Is that what? Uh, Eliezer. Eliezer. Uh, what different kinds of hope do you think are meant in the phrases against all hope and in hope? This is in verse 18. So what different kinds of hope do you think are meant in the phrases against all hope and in hope? Yeah. 
against all hope is no hope, no faith. No hope, no faith. So against all hope, no hope, no faith. Okay, that's good. And with all hope, believe in God, God would provide. In, in faith that God would provide. And Mina, did you have something? No, basically. Okay. When all hope in human form was gone, he placed his hope in God. Right. Right. So, against hope. Because they can't have kids. Mm -hmm. Right. So, against that hope of having kids, mm -hmm. he still had hope. Yeah, that was, yeah. Not that you were wrong. Right. <laughs> and I think that Again, what was the hope? What was the hope against that? Right, the hope against was having kids. Yep. So that would be uh, according against all hope, according to human possibility or ability, and in hope, believing in God's promise, which is a sure thing. So, so the way we use hope, uh, I would imagine most of us view hope the way we would typically use it, as wishful thinking, as an uncertain uh, future outcome that we desire, uh, but to hope in God is really to put your hope in the resurrection of Christ and in God's promises, which are anything but uncertain. They are just not realized by us yet, but they are sure. And they, this goes back to one of the previous questions about eternal life. It, those things are ours now. They belong to us now. They just haven't been completely uh, revealed to us here and now. They will be revealed, which that will be a theme later, I believe, in uh, <laughs> chapter 8 of Romans that we are waiting to... Uh, we are waiting for the waiting for the revelation of what we will be. And so, against all hope, according to human possibilities, uh, so much of this uh, it just reminds me of the, the the lectionary that we are on and where we're at in the church here with Mark and Mark ten after the rich young man. Then Jesus' disciples say, then who can be saved? If a rich man can't be saved, who can be saved? And Jesus says, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Anything else to add there? I just had a thought. It makes me think of people who live by, when all else fails, then I can you know, we've tried everything, yeah. the sciences, I don't care what you want to call it. But ultimately, you have to go to God. Your ways won't work. Yeah, that's a good point. That, and it, uh, I see that a lot with, like, natural disasters. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, things like that. Um, Earthquakes. When the earth shakes, everybody moves up. Right. <laughs> yeah. 18. At first, Abraham laughed at the promise of an heir. What were his doubts and what was his solution? <laughs> Since he couldn't get Sarah pregnant on his own, he's going to work with Hagar. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, his doubts are about his own uh, ability, which is, which is good. You should doubt your own ability, but he had the promise of God. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't need to worry about it because the fact that God promised him meant that Abraham's ability should not have been his focus. So he, he, he was right in thinking and doubting in his own ability, but he needn't obtain the promise through his own scheming. I just, some of the, it's so funny, I, one of the, uh, well, not funny, but one of the funniest things to me is when uh, God promises Zechariah and Elizabeth that they will have a son and he will be named John. And when Zechariah laughs, he can't talk. 
I just think it's so great that then they're all debating about what he should be named, and they're like, no one in your family is named John. This isn't a familial name. Then what? And then so they ask Zechariah, Zechariah, what shall he name? And you just have this picture in your mind of he turns around and grabs a parchment or whatever it is and scribbles, his name is John. I just yeah. think that's really funny. <laughs> All right, anything else to add before we move on to the final day, day five? All right, 20 to 25. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why, we, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In spite of misgivings, Abraham did not stop believing that God would keep his promises. Read Genesis 18.14 and Matthew 19.26 and complete the following sentence as Abraham might have. I believe that God can do all, do all things in his time. Do all things in his time. Someone else? I had do, impossible. do anything even what is impossible for men. Right. What is impossible for men. You right. said he can do the impossible. Yeah. Did anybody else have anything different in your own words? Do all things. Do all things. <laughs> I believe that God can do the impossible. And I think so, uh, the way, uh, or a way of, of thinking about this too, is that, that God is not bound to our human condition, uh, or the things that we do. So, so much of ancient religion in the Middle East was uh, when you, when the nations worships multiple gods, uh, was the predominant belief outside of Israel that was what you did would you could manipulate the gods, because the gods were were seen as as powerful, uh, but they were also seen as capricious yeah. and uh, not maybe all-powerful. Yeah. So more powerful than humans, but not all-powerful, and um, capricious. But our God does not act according to his ways are not our ways. All right. 21. State one or more promises of God that give hope to you as a believer. Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Promise of eternal life. The promise of eternal life. Well, I like looking at rainbows because he promised, you know, when they destroy the world again with water, but it's still a visual reminder. He does keep his promise. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the one. God keeps his promises in the sign of the rainbow. Any other promises? Giving you strength that need. Giving you the strength that you need, so maybe the promise of, of strengthening you in your faith as you journey mm -hmm. in a fallen world. Well, it tells us his grace is enough. You know, his grace is enough. And that it's a gift. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Grace, my grace is sufficient for you. Yeah. Any other promises that give you hope? I look at the promise of, of resurrection. 
uh, of being resurrected in a new body, in a new and perfect body. Uh, because I, I did used to kind of, uh, you know, think that uh, this dualism of body and spirit, that someday I'll shed the body and live uh, free from it as a disembodied soul with God. And I thought that that was the ideal. But that is not our Christian hope. Our Christian hope is the resurrection to uh, not only a new and perfect body that we will be raised in, but new heaven, a new heaven and a new earth as well. Uh, that was something that Pastor and I talked a lot about uh, as there were some questions I don't know if it was related to uh, one of the lectionary readings uh, that was preached on, but one of the conversations that we had for, probably for like the first one or two weeks that, we, that I was in the office was that uh, for a while, for some reason, Christianity totally just ignored this promise of resurrection as an embodied resurrection uh, and, uh, of course, with the new heavens and the new earth, too, so that, that heaven is not our final home, uh, that heaven and earth, when Christ returns, will, will be together, restored. I'm but a stranger here. Yep. The new heaven and earth are my home. <laughs> you can sing a song as long as you fill in the blank, right? It's not, right. Heaven is not my home, but the new creation is my home. Uh, we don't look forward to dying and going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Don't look forward to dying. Dying is a bad thing. It's not what God designed for you. He does not de did not design for you to die. Don't look forward to dying. Look forward to Jesus coming again. End of the church year, Advent. Right? We look forward to Jesus coming again. We don't look forward to dying and going to heaven. So you don't say, I don't know why God doesn't just take me home to heaven. I'm ready to go. You should, you should never be ready to go to heaven. Be ready for Christ to come again. And if He takes you to heaven in the meantime, great. A blessed state. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You don't have your body, though, so there's a lot of things that you can't do in heaven. No body. I don't know how you sing praises to God. You yeah. don't have a mouth or a voice. And I think what we, what we miss about this and why we want to be in heaven is that's where God is, or in our minds. But the reason that, first of all, humans were created to live on earth. We were created to live here on earth. And I, I think the reason that we see, or maybe are tempted to see heaven as our home is because that's where God is. But what we miss is that God does not dwell with us on earth because God does not dwell amidst sin, and that when Christ comes back to restore the creation, as Revelation 21 said earlier that we looked at, uh, that we live on earth, but God will dwell with us because heaven and earth will be perfectly joined together, which they are not right now. Somehow, some way. Better than the new creation. Somehow, Are some way. Better than the first creation. Better than the first creation. Better than the Garden of Eden. And we see that picture. We, we shouldn't be missing it because we already have the picture in the divine service when God comes down to earth to feed us with his body and blood, uh, to speak to us words of forgiveness. Uh, that that is the picture that we get. We don't ascend to God in our Sunday morning worship when we come to church, God comes and meets us here in this place to give us his gifts. That's the picture that we have. That's what we should not be missing when we think about heaven and earth and the new earth and the new heaven. All right. 22, in what way do the words credited to him as righteousness also apply to us? We believe that Jesus died for our sin. That faith is created. That's the righteousness. Right. Through faith. Through faith. Anybody else?
plus on 22. I put in the same way uh, Abraham's faith. Uh, that's the thing is Abraham's faith is in God. So our faith is, is in the same thing. His faith isn't in his works or, uh, or the fact that uh, he was chosen by God for any other reason that God chose him by his own mercy. Uh, that our faith is not in two different things. Our faith is in God and a merciful God who forgives us our sins. And who is doing the crediting? Who credits us as righteous? God. God. And God credited Abraham as righteous. It was... Uh, you like credited to someone's account as a gift as something that that was not earned through a wage or through working that was not one's due, uh, but was credited as a gift. All right, twenty three. Why would either we talked about this a little bit earlier? Why would either Good Friday or Easter Sunday be a worthless celebration without the other? Well, Christ said both die and be raised from the dead in order for. The act to be complete or whatever. Right, the act to be complete. I really like uh, the way you put that there because it's really... Or the task. It's really one act, and I think a, a pastor uh, talked about this a little earlier, really Christ's entire life then you could is, is one act. So it's not death and resurrection as two separate events. It's not even death, resurrection, and all the things that Jesus did in his life as separate events. This is all one mission. And so what do we miss if Christ ascends to heaven but doesn't die? So what, what is not done for us if Christ ascends to heaven without dying? Our sins aren't covered. Right, there's no sacrifice. Our sins are not covered, and oh, we are left oh, in the same place. What's the Greek word? Sins aren't covered. What's that blood covering word? Do you remember the Greek word? It's a fun one. All failed I really like Greek. It's all right. Hilasterion. 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 There's no blood covering if there's no sacrifice. This is why. This is why we preach. What does Paul say? We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. He does not say we preach Christ risen from the dead. We preach Christ crucified. I had a principal, principal's wife at my first congregation stepped into my office one day and said, why do you guys always preach about Jesus' death and never about his resurrection? I was like, well, well, hold on there for a second because we do preach a lot of resurrection, but right, we preach Christ crucified. Word of Paul. We don't. We preach Christ's resurrection also, but without the without the sacrifice, the resurrection doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Now Paul also says that if Jesus had not been raised, your faith is in vain, right? Because then there's no victory. Either. Right. But um, but but it has to be in that order. We preach Christ crucified, because without the sacrifice, there's no blood covering, and you're dead. Mm -hmm. I, I, the crucifixion is the not only the central event of human history, but really like the fulfillment of all of history of all time. Like that event. I forgot the most important part of that story. Yeah. Her point was is that the death is kind of a downer, and the resurrection is more joyous. So we should preach the resurrection more often. More joyous. The death is joyous. Christ's death, why is it called Good Friday? Because his death is joyous for Christians. It's sad and horrible, but the death is joyous. You, you can't get, right? It's really weird though, right? But that, that East, Good Friday is always just very solemn, etc. And then Easter is blah in your face, hallelujahs, right? <coughs> we should be very joyful on Good Friday. Good Friday is a joyous, is a joyous time because it, Christ dies. It's not joyous, and it is a downer if you miss the whole point of what's going on. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Anyway, just an interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else to add on 23? Okay. Well, let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf and for raising him again from the dead, uh, defeating death and Satan and covering over all of our sins. We also thank you, God, for all the saints who have gone before us, uh, who lived by faith in you and not by their works. May we uh, see their example of faith and let their example ultimately point us to the work of Jesus Christ done on the cross on our behalf. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.